Howdy, I'm Rob. Welcome to my YouTube channel. For today's video, I'm going to do another drum build. To start off, here's a drum I built a year ago. My famous puzzle drum. 16 pieces around the outside and two deep. Total of 32 pieces joined together wrapped around a cylinder. This tested my abilities to the extreme. I did not know I'd be able to do it. I put a lot of time and effort into it. It came out great in the end. The drum I want to build today makes this look like child's play. I'm going to have 40 puzzle pieces around the outside and eight deep. That's 320 individual puzzle pieces. This is a really high risk, high reward drum. It might turn out great and it might not. Chances of getting a great drum out of this, I'm saying is probably pretty low. My goal is to have a good drum, but if that doesn't happen, I really hope to learn how to build a drum like this next time learning those mistakes. And the third possible outcome is it's no good. It was a stupid idea. I throw it in the trash heap and we'll burn it down the road later. So let's take a look at the design software and see what my thought process is on trying to build this. Here we are in VCar Pro. And here's the basic puzzle shape I'm working with. I'm actually getting, there's two basic shapes I'm working with, the, the male and the female side. And again, they're very similar because if you rotate 190 degrees, they'll fit there, but there have to be some tolerances for so it can slide together or else it'll be too tight and you'll never get them together. That's the basic shape. On the up and down side, if you look at the drum, of course, it's a cylinder. The up and down, these will be exact 90 degree cuts. Any cut that goes this direction is 90 degrees. Any cut on the sides will be four and a half degrees. And I'll show how I'm getting around that in a minute. I will basically be cutting out shapes that have the female on the up and down, the 90 degree angle, and then male, the 90 degree side. So I'll be cutting out pieces look like these. Flat on one side, eventually I cut out the four and a half degree cut on those, but I can't do multiple different angles in one cut. So all these are 90 degrees, straight up and down perpendicular. So I'll cut out all those pieces out. There'll be 40 strips like that. That'll be a jig you see later. I'm gonna use that to hold it in place while I'm cutting the angles. So once I have all these pieces cut out and glued together, then I'll cut this shape out on the sides and that will give us our four sides of the puzzle piece. And here's kind of the end result, what you'll see. So even though this is all one big strip glued together with different puzzle pieces, then I'll cut the sides out with one long tool path there, that there, and it'll look like eight pieces, eight separate pieces. I mentioned they're 1.1 inches wide and tall. It's hard to explain, but I'm going from point here to point here is that 1.1, because it's not a very straight edge here. So I have to find a, a spot there to make it work. So 1.1 from there to there and there to there. So it's an eight inch drum in the end. Actually that's marked there as eight and eight. So my pieces will be closer to nine and I'll cut off the edges to get a nice smooth finish on the end. So that's the puzzle pieces, the whole process. So I'll cut out 320 pieces like this and it's not fast. It's a tiny eighth inch bit. I'm not pushing too hard. It's taking around two minutes per piece and 320 times two is 642 minutes, 640 minutes just for the pieces there. So we're at over 10 hours already on the CNC machine and we've only got the up and down sides done. There'll be almost that other 10 hours to get each side there. So I'm gonna have 20 hours invested of CNT, CNC time on this before I even have a shell completed. So this is gonna be labor intensive drum. These I'm probably gonna do two actually. I'll do one that's two more basic colors and if it works or if I learn my dual wrong, I'll do another one with more dramatic color pieces. The, the first one I'm gonna use maple and cherry, which are similar colors, but still enough different that you can see the puzzle pieces. Once I'm confident I can do it right, I will use some more expensive woods. I have some lighter colors, myrtle, maple again, probably maybe a cherry is a light one and darker I'll use walnut, I have some rosewood that's got a nice red color and maybe some zircote. Zircote, I'm not sure I even say that one. I might even throw more, but I have three or four light, three or four dark. And then to another point that I want to talk about, when I cut the last drum, I had problems where some of the pieces would not go together right. They would, it was strange. If I put them together 
the top to top, it wouldn't fit right. But if I flipped one of them upside down, they fit together much better. My theory is I was having some run out on my bit. So the bit spins, well, in theory, it's perfectly straight up and down, which nothing is ever perfect. And of course, for a wood CNC router, you have less perfection than you have for NASA numbers. But I'm sure as the drum, the bit got further away from the collet, the bit, there's probably spins out a little bit and it comes out, a variation is deeper here. So you get a piece that looks kind of like these, where that edge is a little more width here. So in theory, if I rotate up and down the pieces, some right side up, some right side down, then when I put it together, it'll be a much smoother fit. Now that's just a theory, and I have a cheap machine. I know I do. I It's built out of plywood. I built it myself, and I'm a very frugal guy. It's a nice way of saying cheap. I think I have pretty good tolerances on my machine, and this kind of shook me a little bit, thinking that I have a lot of problems on my machine. Right after I did my snare drum, the puzzle drum, I watched a video by Frank Haworth. He does a lot of projects on his CNC machine that are very inventive. I like to think we think alike on some things because he's doing some things that are very strange and he's done some puzzle things, things that are off the wall. And I know I think I'm a kindred spirit with him though. I've never talked to him before. He had probably never seen my videos, but anyway, he was doing a project and he had the same exact issue. He was doing some puzzle pieces and he noticed we flipped them upside down. Every other one, it was working much better. So he was, he suspected he's had run out, which was already my theory. So we both have that same theory what the problem is. Now, he has a much nicer machine than I do. He has an Avid Pro Series. He has many thousand dollars invested in that machine. So it made me feel a little better that a top-end machine was having the same issue as I was. In the end, an eighth-inch bit is just going to have some deflection when it starts cutting. So I suspect it's more a bit issue than a machine issue. If you're going down an eighth-inch bit to get a nice tight cut in tight spaces like I'm doing, you're not getting around having some deflection. So if you can't beat it, you know, work with it. Half my pieces are going to cut upside down from the bottom instead of the top. And that way I should get a tighter fit, more of a puzzle fit, I guess you would say, but I should have a much tighter fit that way. And I've been doing a lot of tests over the past few weeks, a lot of tests. I've probably cut 60, 70 puzzle pieces out, more than that, actually. And I've got good tolerances now. I'm alternating and I'm very happy with what I've got. So I think I'll have better results than I had with the last drum. The last drum I'm very happy with, but I'm going to have, as we said before, 40 rows or staves, eight pieces high. So 320 pieces, I need to have better tonches now than I did last time when I had 16 pieces. So let's head out the machine and start cutting up some parts and see how they fit together. Actually, before we head out to the machine, let's take a look at some of the test pieces I did getting ready for these final versions. I mentioned before it was around 20 hours of total work putting this together for the actual drum. I didn't include my dev time in that. I'm sure there's at least 20, 30 hours getting these correct, designing, test fitting, redoing, more test fitting, getting it right. I spent a lot of time playing with this. And like I said, I'm pretty happy with the joints, the fits together now. You can see some of these weren't great, but I kept improving, kept testing, and from there, I got a good design, I think. So now, let's set up the machine and start cutting the actual pieces for the drum. So now that I'm starting to cut out the puzzle pieces, there'll be four unique shapes I'm cutting out in this process. The first will be this one, which will be on the top or bottom of the drum, whichever way you flip the drum. It has one puzzle out each side and three straight edges. I will do 40 of these, actually more than 40, because I hate to have some extras. And then the other light colored piece will have an Audi on both the left and right side and a straight edge on the top and bottom. Once I get to the darker color wood, there will be any puzzle pieces for the bottom side or top again, and then a left and right any on that way. The bit I'm using for this is an eighth inch down cut. Why am I using a down cut, the question is. Well, when using a down cut, it forces the wood chips, or dust in this case, back into that joint, and it holds the pieces in place. Much less shifting of the piece, and it will be a more accurate piece in the end, I'm hoping. 
Of course, I have tabs holding these in place also, but that extra wood being forced in that joint will help it hold steady and get a cleaner cut in the end. Here is a quick shot of that piece we just cut out. The second light colored piece we need will be the middle part of the drum. It'll be a puzzle Audi piece on both sides, then again, a straight edge on the bottom top from this angle. I'll be doing 120 of these pieces, again, a few extras, because I know I'll have some mess ups later. So 120 pieces, again, is a lot more than 40, and the span is longer on this piece of wood. So I'm gonna be moving around the clamps through this video. Uh, the first time I'll actually show you me moving them and clamping extra pieces. And later on, you'll magically see that the clamps have changed positions without me showing that to you. You can figure out what's going on. A moment ago, when I talked about cutting these pieces and using a down cut bit, I mentioned how it pushes the wood chips or dust into that joint to hold it firm. And dust is a good word for this. As it pushes those chips into the joint, it keeps cutting it over and over again and pulverizes it into a dust. That can be good, can be bad. It's probably not good for the life of a bit because it keeps recutting that and it generates some heat. So you've got to be careful that you're not overheating the bit. But the good part that I like about this is that dust comes out very fine, almost like a sand or even flour. Now, later I'll use this, mix that with glue and fill the gaps. It makes a great filler that will perfectly match the color of that wood. When I first had the concept for this drum, I knew I wanted to use a 1 8 inch bit to work on this. That's a small bit I can work with where I trust the reliability and won't break bits. I based the size of the puzzle piece on the size of the bit. I designed the any part of the puzzle piece as small as possible while a 8 inch bit would still fit inside it. Once I had the any size of the puzzle piece figured out, I played with proportions and ended up with a 1.1 inch puzzle piece. And from there, I ended up with eight rows tall and 40 rows around the drum. Have you ever bought anything and it said in the instructions, some assembly required? Here's my drum, some assembly required. Remember earlier when I mentioned I'm cutting some of these for the top and some for the bottom? Here's a good example of that. You can see the triangle tabs there that will always be in the bottom when you cut it. So you can tell I flipped them over. And it slides together pretty easy, but if I try to go past that center point, it gets harder and harder. So a good example of how that works. Now I'm going to glue up one of the up and down pieces, or a stave as I'm calling them in my brain. If you look close, you can see those triangles are on the bottom of that piece, on the dark pieces, and on the light, it's on the top. First thing, I'm gonna do a dry fit, just to make sure everything fits. On a few of these, on the outie part, there's a little ridge, I'm not sure quite why it was getting that. Something to do with the tool path is leaving that bit there. If it's a little bit long, it'll stick out too far and it'll leave a little wiggle in the piece. So on a few pieces, I found that and then I would get some sandpaper and take off that little ridge and I got a much tighter fit there. So now there's our dry fit, looks good. We'll take it back apart and you can even see a few times it's a little hard to pull apart because you get tight at the end, just like we we're talking before that last example. Keep them in order, and we'll get out the glue. As you can see, I'm just putting one drop of glue on each side of that. I have to hurry because the glue will run downhill and drip off if I'm not careful. I'm very careful to make sure I push it inside the ridge on the outy part. And it fits together nice and tight, like we said. On to the next piece. It might be more efficient to use some kind of glue brush, but I think my fingers worked out good in the end. I get a little gummy by the end because I'm doing 40 of these, or again, I did four extras, and in the end I had some screw-ups. So I even had to do a few more than that. So when I told you it was 20 hours cutting out parts, it's more than that because, and again, on a first development phase, you make mistakes and you have to make more extras than you plan on originally. Anyway, it comes together nice and tight here. And I will finish the glue up. One more piece here. Then I will get my clamp out. I want to make sure it's nice and flat on the bottom there. Because the pieces aren't 100% consistent, some will be a little taller and shorter. So the bottom is very flat. The top might not be flat. Put under pressure, glue it up tight. 
and we can see the bottom looks really good. No glue spewing out on that side. Eventually I'll skim off the top, making it perfectly smooth on top, and every piece will be identical thickness. Before we actually show the machine cutting out the outside edges of these staves, I want to show the jigs that I'm using. They're at a 4.5 degree angle, and I have two of them. One I'll be cutting from the bottom and the top, as I mentioned before, though at this point it's more the inside of the drum and the outside of the drum I'm cutting from. I've mentioned this 4.5 degrees multiple times. My jig here is angled at 4.5 degrees, but I haven't explained why I'm using 4.5 degrees yet. There are 40 staves that wrap around the drum, and each joint will be 9 degrees. 40 times 9 equals 360 degrees. Because it takes two staves to make up that 9 degrees, we have 4.5 degrees on each side, and you put both together, you get those 9 degrees. This process is actually very time consuming. Now, before I told you it took two minutes for each puzzle piece when I cut out the first original blanks, and now it's taking eight minutes for this process to do one side of those. So you would think two minutes versus eight, this is more efficient, but actually no. I've got to come every eight minutes, change out that piece into the jig and start it again. So every eight minutes, you've got to come do this. Very time consuming. But I came up with a trick that'll make it twice as efficient. So I've got to come out every 16 minutes instead of eight minutes. Still time consuming, but much, much better in the end. I combined the tool path for the inside cut, the one jig, and the outside cut for the other jig into one long tool path. So I come out every 16 minutes instead of every eight minutes. Note how the machine pops up, moves over to the other jig, and starts cutting. This is all done automatically. I did not do anything manually. This was all done in the code of the tool paths. To explain how I did this, I need to get back to basics. A CNC machine works on a grid. If you're looking at the machine from the front, Left and right would be X, forward and back towards you would be Y, and up and down is Z, X, Y, Z. Each start you start at the machine, you'll set the X, Y, and Z for your bed so it understands where it is in relationship to itself. That grid for the bed of your CNC machine is called G53. I don't know why, it just is. When you put a piece of wood on your CNC bed and you want to cut it into something, you need to set the X, Y, zero point on that piece of wood. This XYZ is called G54. So G53 is for the bed itself, so the machine understands where it is on the bed. G54 is for the part you're going to cut out. It's possible to put another piece of wood on your bed to cut something out with, and you'll name that one G55. Another piece of wood, G56. You can do this for 10 or more different coordinates. In my case, I have the left jig as G55 and the right jig as G56. Pretty much all I did was had a G-code for the left one and the right one and copied and pasted it into one long G-code and in the middle I told it to switch to G56. It wasn't quite that simple, but really it wasn't much harder than that. The video is already over 18 minutes and this is a good stopping point. I finished cutting all those staves, the exact same process as we already saw, and now I've done a dry fit. This is not glued up. Just getting around shape, measuring, make sure it's good, and I'm happy with the shape and size and width of the drum. I actually did do a couple, two pieces glued together in a few spots. You can look close, you can see the glue up there. The next steps will be to glue it up, make sure it's perfectly round when we do that, then take it to the rotary CNC and skim the outside and inside, and then we'll add some finish to it, see how it comes out. I'm gonna skip a little bit ahead here. When I was finishing the drum, there was this little face I kept seeing the drum as I kept spinning it around. And I kind of decided it looks like Curious George to me, but if you think it looks like something different, please add it to the comments section and let me know what you think it looks like. As always, if you've enjoyed seeing this video and you made it this far, which I really appreciate, please give me a like. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks and everyone have a great day.